welcome to all of you in the world. It's an interesting topic we're talking about. And um, yeah, let's start to say who you are. Let's start with Nainita. Nainita uh, has scored countless BAFTA, Oscar, Emmy acclaimed production, was nominated for Oscar for Zama, a documentary last year, um, which won in Cannes and in, uh, at BAFTA. Hello and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, lovely to see you all virtually. Um, thank you, Milena. Welcome. So coming to Lolita. Lolita Rismanis is a Latvian American composer known for her film and television scores, including her work on the animated series Batman Beyond. And she was nominated at the World Soundtrack Academy uh, Awards for Public Choice. Hello and welcome. Wonderful to be here. I wish I were with you in person, but... Uh... Okay, um, Diego, Nora and Lionel Baldenweg. Siblings from Switzerland, born in Australia, songwriters, label owners, composers for um, Die Kleine Hexe uh, and Swingli. And uh, they were also nominated uh, last year for Best Score at the World Soundtrack Awards. Welcome. Hello. Hello. So in coming to Michael Abel's composer, uh, producer, best known for his scores for writer-director Jordan Peele, Oscars winning film Get Out and the highly anticipated follow-up us, us uh, and you were awarded for Discovery of the Year in 2019 at the World Soundtrack Awards. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I wanted to start first um, asking every one of you um, about the, your experience in that field as being everyone worked for a while in that industry. We all live in different countries. So um, is the topic of diversity and the, or the probably the topic of non-diversity as it was for a very, very long time. Um, how did it affect your work uh, in the past? Maybe you can tell your experiences and what, what did you always came up with or what did you have to face in an industry which, as we all know, was not diverse until now? Well, I'm happy to start. Um, I was fortunate to be mentored by the late Shirley Walker, who uh, was a powerhouse composer and um, everyone should know her work. Uh, so for me, be starting in the business and having this role model to look up to, a, a true champion, um, and still to this day, I think people mention her when they talk about diversity and people that managed to break through and break the, the we call it the cement ceiling, it's not the glass ceiling. But um, because I had a mentor that was female, I didn't even, it didn't even, I didn't, it didn't register. Yes, she was female, but it, I just did my work as best I could and I worked for her. So I, I didn't necessarily feel that I was um, challenged in that way of, of getting jobs, you know, not getting jobs because of being a female. But I did hear through her in her voice often this kind of lament that she had almost made it to the, the top list to, to to get the big feature but then always you know some gen, generally uh, white male composer would get the job and um, then in, in recent years um, I've heard things from from many top composers where there is a, a reticence to hire a female composer for a top big big budget film because of the idea that a, a woman isn't capable of organizing and managing such a, a large scale project. So that is the that is the thing that um, as one of the founders of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, one of, one of the biggest things that I've wanted to try to dispel this ridiculous idea that a woman isn't capable of, of taking the helm on a big project. I mean, <laughs> We are pretty, we are multitasking fierce, uh, fierce uh, professionals in the business. And, and that, that seems like a ridiculous uh, concept. So. I think I, we I, all agree. So, but mm -hmm. what are the other experiences? I'm, I can say that it took, uh, it took uh, Jordan Peele, a black director to um, look at me and say, hey, I could see this guy being someone who could score my film and could, um, and it, it, what is surprising to me, but noticeable. And um, since then, I think also at the time that uh, Get Out came out, a lot of films came out that busted Hollywood's notion that diversity didn't do well at the box office. 
if anything, it showed that diversity can be a key to success at the box office. And since then, I've seen a lot of um, uh, a lot more composers uh, from many different backgrounds um, getting opportunities to work. And also the fact that there are so many more platforms these days, it seems like the world has gone content crazy. And that means that um, composers of all stripes need, uh, have opportunities for jobs to tell stories that weren't getting told before. So um, at least in the last couple years, uh, I can at least say that there's been a lot of, I've noticed a lot of opening up um, of people's uh, conception of what a composer uh, ought to be or, or looks like or a background that a composer has. So, but before you started working with Jordan, um, did you try to really get into the business and you failed for obvious or not obvious reasons somehow? There's a lot of people who are looking for success in the industry and it sometimes takes many years. Um, and there's a lot of talented people who never get opportunities and some of that is just luck. And so you don't, you don't really know what the, th what the case is because you only have one life. There's no double blind study, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I certainly noticed that uh, it was Jordan who seemed to give me the, the yes when others said no. And this might be one problem as well that you probably just don't know because if, if someone says, no, we have another composer, it, it could be that they just choose someone else, but it's, you don't know if it's for other reasons that they and, didn't say and, yes to you. And some of it is that people are, people are by nature tribal. And what I mean is you tend to spend time and hang out and work with people you know. Hmm. And that's not, that's, that's just natural, that's just instinctual. And being diverse requires a person going outside their natural, um, the people they hang out with. <laughs> it requires kind of a, a stretching that diversity muscle and looking for people, realizing that diversity is important for creativity and for solving problems creatively. But you, uh, people need to be trained to want to do that and to look at that as a good thing. And so um, some of it is not people wanting to um, discriminate, I think, in a way that's intentional, but it's just about, about if you grow up around people, those are the people you know, and if you, 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 feel, you feel good with them, you like them, and you don't have a need to travel outside your comfort zone as until it's pointed out to you that diversity matters, not just for solving things creatively, but for actually making our whole experience as a society better. Mm -hmm. And so um, we need to look at diversity as a way to help all of us be better at what we do, not just something that is, um, that's, that we're told is a good thing that you know, we need to do. Mm -hmm. You make a very interesting point there, Michael, about tribalism and wanting to work with people that, uh, or surround yourself with teams and people that look like you and that you feel comfortable with. And I think one of the ways that we're combating this only in the last couple of years with certainly with award ceremonies is unconscious bias training you know we're we're all uh, i mean i am a victim of unconscious bias uh, in in many different ways you know sexism ageism racism or without us realizing and and i think that you know when we're made aware of what we're liable you know susceptible to just in our everyday living then being aware of it helps us change things, you know, on a, on a singular basis from, you know, one person at a time. So um, I think, you know, with the, with the BAFTA awards, I don't know if whether the Academy Awards in the US do it, but certainly with BIFA in the UK, the British Independent Film Awards, the, um, uh, the Ivers Academy Awards, our music awards here, which is the equivalent of the Grammys and, and the BAFTAs where we're implementing this unconscious bias training now. Um, which is a very positive step. Mm -hmm. I can say, looking back, you know, I mean, we've done this for a few years now, but uh, originally I think it was a lot of the times it was the female producers and showrunners that actually connected us with other people who actually believed in our work um, and weren't scared of sharing their contacts. And I think 
that was an important stepping stone. You know, being in a place like Switzerland, surrounded with all the mountains, we always had to move out out of the country and actually go to film festivals and watch many films. And that's what we do, the three of us. You know, we we watch films from all countries, from you know, from different filmmakers and usually from about 30 films, there's maybe two, three that the three of us like, and we're very individual characters, but that's how you kind of enlarge the tribe globally. And the tribe can be very diverse. And, and looking back at uh, the people that we've worked with, they've had the most diverse backgrounds ever. And um, I think it's because of motiv a mutu mutual motivation that kind of brought us together. And that's important that you keep looking for that. And, don't just wait for what's coming your way or not, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think something that I thought was really interesting what, um, as well, what uh, Lolita and Michael and Anita touched on before, it's also um, working with diverse people. Obviously, we, you know, you're all saying like, it's more fun as well to, to, to have diverse voices. But I also think the most important thing is also you just reach more diverse people if you're if you're including more people and it's not just obviously we all want a fun job and we all want to have lots of different inspirations and inputs but it's also just great to to realize that now while we're all um you know focusing on that more is that we can actually reach more people we can tell more stories and you can you, you can see that a lot more people are interested in things that um you know when you're finding other people who believe in the same thing as you or who are interested in the same thing or inspired by the same things you tell a story and you always realize wow someone else loves that too and that's really really great I think and kind of a new thing that's happening uh, being allowed to expand being allowed to expand your circle being allowed to yeah, exactly. kind of go that's it's that it's a real joy to get to know other creative people in the industry um, I think for for females the difficulty especially for younger females starting out is that there's the added the, the added problem of of danger sometimes within the workplace and 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 as one of the leaders in in the with the alliance um, hearing these hearing stories and remembering from early days um, not necessarily having dealing with some some a criminal activity um, as far as some sort of sexual harassment or um, it was one of these situations where um, where young the young composers come and say well we have a situ I have a situation where you know I am being put in this position where you know it's it's a precarious position where my career won't be advanced I mean it's it's I think with the with the whole me too movement there, it was kind of a double thing. It was not just that women weren't being considered for these top, the top tentpole films. It was that it wasn't, it wasn't safe for especially the younger women. So as, as a seasoned, uh, uh, you know, woman uh, that is no longer, <laughs> I've been married for 31 years and, and I don't have that situation, but I, I see some of these situations still happening now. So even though we are very mindful of what's going on, it's, um, it's still, we still have to fight like fight like crazy to make sure that it doesn't happen and to just have these conversations and and it doesn't I mean it's really fun to have the tribe and to have a fun a group of people that you can feel free to just be yourself with but if you're creatively you're on guard because you're wondering well I can't be too I can't be too fun maybe somebody will take this the wrong way I mean it's it's very it's a it's a very um, difficult position for for um, especially our young women composers to be in, and you know I, I hate the fact that we have to even discuss that aspect of it, but it is something that that um, I'm I'm my, my hats off to uh, to Laura Cartman at the at the Academy and 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 also to you know to our other leaders in the industry that are bringing attention to this and just getting people to realize it's important to. Just, just stop doing that. Let's just have a wonderful relationship on a creative level, and we can enjoy each other's company without having that that sexual energy that we have to deal with. I think something that really helps for this also is to to have um, good buddies, regardless of um, you know, as a composer, you can have a, a really good instrumentalist as a buddy who might go to film festivals with you. And you could say, hey, this is my guitar player, my violin player, I'm the composer. You automatically become a team and you're not vulnerable by yourself standing around 
on your own, you know? So I think it's important. It makes you more interesting as well and to have somebody cool around you. And that's what we've had the fortunate thing to have around us as a, being siblings. We've always had us around each other. But I think if I went out on my own or my sister, we both um, had these uncomfortable moments on our own. And I think for us, it was always a, a great thing to have us as a team just hanging out together and having fun anyhow. And then if we meet people, we can share the fun. And I think if you're on your own, it's important to maybe have you, have a new team around you if, if you can't, you know, um, if you're, yeah, if you feel unsafe in a way, you know? Natural physical tribe. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been, in my very early days, I was, um, I've experienced uh, verbal abuse from executive producers. You know, I think on my my very first one of my very first jobs, I was working very late on a Saturday night. I was in a dubbing theater um, in a in a sort of dubbing editing suite, and uh, I needed to get the work done uh, or on to a very tight deadline. And I had this um, exec producer who came in and started shouting abuse at me, asking me to work faster and get, get it all done. And of course, I was never going to miss the deadline. But I think I was very young and, and he brought me to tears. And I think if that happened to me now, I would tell him where to go, you know, and I, and I wouldn't stand for it. But I think that, you know, possibly Lolita is re re referring to instances where you're preyed upon by by it it's an abuse of power um you know not you know not it's a necessarily in a sexual way but certainly you know it's an, a, an abuse of power and it's preying upon people who are, are young or inexperienced or weak and and you feel yourself in a situation that you feel unable to handle um luckily uh, a man walked past and and he heard what was going on and he said you know and he, and he told the man how to handle himself in front of me and and it never happened again but i mean you know to answer your first question milena you know about my experiences of diversity and how i came up in the industry um i actually started writing with my who's with my writing partner for the first four or five years and that was about 23 24 years ago and he's he's now my husband and we don't work together anymore but um it was a very interesting situation where i would go for meetings with uh, producers and filmmakers with him and we would turn up as a team and and I was always, I, I started off as a music engineer and I was always the geek and the person into technology. And people would always direct the conversation towards my partner who couldn't handle the music technology side of the business. And so they'd ask him questions and, and he was wonderful because he used to say, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe you should ask Nanita. She's sitting right <laughs> next to me. And and so the conversation would become def def deflected onto me. And as soon as I open my mouth, I go, oh, I think she knows what she's talking about. And that always broke the ice. And that was great. But it was always those preconceived, you know, being put into a box of stereotyped as a certain type of person who's not a white male engineer or producer or able to handle the <laughs> programming side but of things. Do you, do you feel like if you hadn't showed up with him, you wouldn't have even been asked the questions? It would have been harder. And of course, you know, as the years went by, uh, I grew a client base that trusted me. But it was it was also always a case of, and, and still now, you know, I think for, for, not for me now, but for a lot of younger women I come across where you have to prove yourself and feel that you have to work twice as hard as anyone else. And, and I've always seen myself from the inside out, never from the outside in. I've always, you know, I've never let, I, I've always wanted to be a composer, but, but we all suffer from imposter syndrome to a certain extent. And I did suffer from imp imposter syndrome for, for a long time. I never thought that I could be a composer be uh, and make a, make a living out of being a composer for a living because all the composers that I knew of that were role models were all old white men that were dead. <laughs> or, or, uh, or I, mean, I, had, I had no female role models, virtually none. 
uh, in the in the UK. You know, my role models were Kate Bush and uh, Joni Mitchell and Barbara Streisand. You know, I had no film or television composers really, apart from Shirley Walker and Rachel Portman. You know, that sort of literally, I can count on one hand the number of female film composers at when I was coming up through the ranks. And of course, everything has changed now and is changing for the better. Um, but uh, but that was my experience of coming up in the industry. Mm. I think we all have these experiences. I worked as a DJ for a long time and every time I came into the club, someone t tried to explain to me how it works, like the vinyl thing and the, 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 the turntable. And I always said, yeah, I think I know what, it's not so difficult to put the, the arm on the, on the plate and just play a record, but anyway. So, but um, uh, Lulita, you mentioned me too. Um, would you agree that this was probably not yeah, probably it was some sort of a starting point because there was talks about diversity and about things before, but with that thing, it really came it came into the focus of many, many people. The whole Harvey Weinstein, the whole Me Too thing, that it just changed some, something, not just in, in terms of uh, sexual harassment, but also in the minds of people. I think it was the second, for as far as the Alliance and this formation of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, it really started with, with a luncheon that we had at BMI with Doreen Ringer Ross. And Doreen invited about 20 female composers to a luncheon just so we would meet each other. And every, we all were looking at each other like, oh, we didn't know there were that many. And I mean, we're talking only 20. And this was about three years before Me Too. Um, and... Um, it was just, it was so mind boggling because we had gone to these, I'd gone every year to the BMI awards ceremony. I saw Laura Cartman in the distance. I saw Miriam Cutler in the distance, just a handful of women composers. And um, it always seemed like, well, which one, who, which one will get the gig? Will, will any one of one of the, and it, there can't be only one. So there were 20 of us. And then the three of us came together and decided to form this alliance. And from that point um, until now, now we have about 500 members. Um, and then there's also a chapter in England and Australia. And, and the first charge was really to amplify the work of female composers and to get female composers in the room, not to have a um, tokenism like, oh, we're going to give a woman this job just because she's a woman, but just, uh, just allow a woman to audition for the job have a, to have a seat at the table mm -hmm. um and it's you know it's been like pushing this boulder like slowly slowly pushing the boulder but but i think that when the me too thing happened and that became you know that's criminal activity the uh, the unconscious bias we're not we don't we don't think we're discriminating against women but maybe we are that has been going on for a long time but this me too kind of pushed it over the edge where People really had to take it seriously. And I'm finding now that the energy that is in the business to be inclusive, not for the point, not for the reason of being inclusive, but for the reason of wanting to embrace diverse voices um, and wanting to, to embrace diverse voices, not because, oh, Lolita is a woman, her music must be, must sound like a woman. So it'll probably just be piano and strings. And, and if you're African-American, oh, you're great at jazz, but not probably the classical score, not for those reasons, but for the reason of, of bringing my perspective as a human being, how, how I see a story as a woman, how I, how I feel the story, how I perceive it. That's the exciting part. And that's where filmmakers and television directors and producers um, they're actually getting excited about about this opening the gate. So mm. that's that's. I mean, it's it's really it's. It, Me too did have something to do with it, but it it has it's been a long push. I don't know, Michael. I mean, the idea that you were discovery of the year, um, you know, at not at age eighteen, but <laughs> you know, no. I think that's you know <laughs> that's a wonderful. And I you know I feel kind of like I've had a little bit of a being discovered with my Blizzard of Souls uh, sound uh, soundtrack, um, you know, with the big big orchestra because people do pigeonhole us in certain categories. So. Yes, I, I was um, a lot of what you said relate. I can relate to through uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, which has really, at least in the United States, if not worldwide, caused people to understand the the what systemic racism is, not just overt racism. Um, but prior to that, um, the Composers Diversity Collective, which I co-founded, which happened when I would see other composers of color at events 
across the room and we would all say, hey, you know, we look, I know we should hang out. And we, we finally said, you know, we should hang out and here's when and where. And uh, we sent out an invitation 10 days before the event, which is not what you do <laughs> for an organized event. But we, uh, we, we thought we'd have 10 people. We had 50 people come to our first meeting. Mm -hmm. And I've never met so many composers uh, from around the world of every gender and ethnicity and cultural background. And um, my life has been incredibly enhanced and my own ability at, um, at coming to understand people from other cultures has been uh, increased, you know, a hundredfold. Um, and this was about two years ago now. But then uh, when, when Black Lives Matter happened, what I've also seen is an opening in the industry where people are really motivated to feel like they want to do something about this and that they feel, I can tell a lot of people feel a, a personal responsibility. They feel for the first time, oh, I see that this is something I can do something about in my place in the industry, whether I'm a person of power like an executive or maybe I'm a Maybe I'm a composer. I mean, one of the ways we, we can, just in the people that we hire as our assistants or that we mentor, we can make choices that we wouldn't always make. And in doing that, you can make a huge difference in someone's life. And that's really how systemic societal change is still made one person at a time. And so um, we all, our, our members, we kind of look at ourselves and see how we can be diverse and we wanna help be role models for other people um, both for young people who maybe look at us uh, as, as someone who they identify with because of our background, or as someone who can be diverse in the way that we interact with people to just help make the world a better place. All of these movements, uh, no matter if it's uh, the Black, uh, Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement or whatever, I think it really builds awareness and, and awareness also makes people more aware of how they should actually interact with people. And I think what it really does is, um, or I at least hope it does, I think it stops a lot of bullying. And I think there's a lot of people who are empowered to actually um, find circles where, where you can actually just be normal together. And I think that's something that's just recently started, I think. Uh, finding like-minded people and lifting each other up and connecting all of that is kind of a new thing. And so something that we've not really had here in the UK, which is very much a part of US culture, I think, is the, the concept of <laughs> mentoring and, and mentees. And we've never had that to such an extent here. And over the last year, I mean, possibly instigated by COVID and the whole uh, discussions that we've been having in the industry about mental health and, and wellness as well over the last 10 months is this concept of mentoring. And so many, we've had so many schemes Opening, opening up via BAFTA, BAFTA Connects, which is putting female um, w women together. Uh, and so I was, you know, mentoring female composers, um, lots of initiatives. The Ivers Academy has set up a mentoring scheme, 40 composers mentoring 40 new emerging composers. So that's, that's something that's rolling on. And I think it's, it's really encouraging to see that concept of giving back and uh, you know I, I set up the remote recording directory for remote uh, recording musicians and we had 700 responses uh, in in March this year because of COVID composers uh, helping musicians musicians helping composers and and forging collaborations and so many of them are women um, you just mentioned role models, and I think everyone mentioned that. So, so you would agree that having role models, how, whoever they are and however they, they work, is really, really important because you, you have something, you, you, you have a path in front of you where you can just say, oh, someone went this path before me and I can just follow. So when it's changing now, and I think we all agree, it, it's in change probably, not, we're not at the end of the, of the change now, but I think things are rolling. So um, we would, would need more role models. And, um, but do you feel that, that there's actual change 
there? And um, what else shall we um, go for? Because we, as I said, we are not at the end of the line, Michael. Well, I feel like there's there's an opening. We, we several of us have cited that that we notice that things are different than they used to be just recently, and we don't we don't know as if that's a if that's a current fad or if it's a sea change, <laughs> and that can only be seen over many years of of this fad staying fashionable. <laughs> and that's a, that's a big thing to ask, but I'm certainly optimistic and we all need to keep doing the work and knowing that it takes, um, that it, it really does take, you know, a generational shift takes a generation and we are all, we all have to be committed to making sure that happens. But about role models, I, I would just wanna say if there are any young people watching this, you know, that it's, it, we've all talked about how important it is to have to have role models and feel like an industry is open to you and you can see examples of people that you identify with who are having success. But at the same time, you have to be prepared to be, like what I say, being, being black, I say, I have to be prepared to be the darkest face in the room. I may be the diversity. <laughs> and if you are uncomfortable being the diverse hire, <laughs> Uh, or the diverse person, um, it would help you to get over that, to be able to just go out and be the first one. You know, how is a society and, and, and an industry going to become diverse if you're not willing to step out and be the first? And so, especially in a creative field, um, you know, there's an opportunity. You, even if you don't see someone who, who looks like you, don't let that stop you from living your dreams. Do not let it stop you. And the, and the other side of that is that role models do matter and we, we need to, um, those of us who, uh, who it, when someone looks to me as a role model, I'm very, I'm, very, I'm very honored by that. I mean, that's a huge thing. And I try to, when people tell me that, I try to, um, you know, to honor that. And I try to, uh, to the extent that I have time to be, available to people in a way that I might not otherwise, just because I, you know, you never know when you have an opportunity to make a difference. And maybe, maybe a, a day for you that is just like any other is the day that somehow someone else sees something and it changes their lives. You know, we can, we can all think of teachers who may have said something on a certain day and they were just saying, it was a regular day to them, but for, for you, when you heard what they had to say, it just was transformative. So I think all of us who are uh, in somehow in a niche in in as composers uh, have an opportunity to um, help the next generation and I can see and everybody here I think is, is definitely doing that and it's inspiring to be a, among a group of people like that. So <laughs> So what else, Lolita, as you are from the- Sorry. No, no, Sorry. no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking, okay, we, we, we ended now because everything is said and it's the perfect final. <laughs> cue, cue music finale, that was great. <laughs> no, it's, I, I know it's what, what Michael said the, the, for, for me, just as a human being, to, to feel that somebody cares about what I have to say, just to be heard. Um, that, that I think that's such a great gift to give somebody. And um, I have so many uh, composers, uh, women and men that reach out to me because somehow the word gets out and I'm sure Michael, you have this problem where you where the word gets out that, oh, Lolita listens to me, listens to our music and she'll, she'll, she'll respond. And, you know, she does respond. It's, you know, hundreds of emails sometimes and the emails are four or five paragraphs long and the playlists are, are, you know, 15 tracks that are each, you know, over three minutes. So my, my, gen, my, my call to action to, to the young composers out listening out there is think about what your, I, I don't want to say it's an elevator speech, but think about what, if you have, if you can grab a moment of somebody's time, what, what, are, what can you do in, in just a few minutes? What do you want? And what is your, what is your voice that you want to present to the world? Um, at my age, I am re reinventing myself, and I spent so much of my career just following the rolling snowball, realizing that, you know, maybe I want to start a smaller snowball rolling down a different 
or I shouldn't say rolling down sounds negative, something climbing up uh, to, <laughs> to another, to another, to another uh, path. I mean, for me, I've been writing melodic orchestral music my entire career. The fact that I've been I had great success in animation didn't mean I abandoned my 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 other love of you know feature film writing and so it's like I feel like I'm discovering myself and if I can pass that kind of energy along to a young composer too don't to not abandon your true passion to not let obstacles of race or gender stop you but don't be blind to the fact that those obstacles are there just say okay I'm a woman Let's say you're, you know, what, what if you're a, a black young woman? How's that? That that's you know now you've got a double double whammy, you know, you're gonna, you're either some people say oh she's only being hired because she's black and she's a woman, so then you have to deal with that that ridiculous concept, but that's that that is that is the fact. So you just tackle it head on, and you'd be the best that you can be, and you'd write killer music, and you'd be professional, and you you show up to the meeting you understand all the characters you you've you've read this you've watched the film you've read the story you know the backstory you know everything about the people you're going to be meet, meeting with and you present yourself as just this powerful strong person so we have to do that as people that are underrepresented in the industry we have to step up to that higher higher level so that we are heard what I'm taking with me is that you all believe that we are sort of in the middle of a process and I'm very hopeful that it's not that they're not turning back time because I think it's it's when you talk to people when, um, in, in the industry in, in certain especially with the streamers I think there's no discussion about turning back time it can be it can come in, in, in different ways of course we don't know but at the moment, the feeling I got from talking to Netflix and all these um, streamers is that they just focus on as much diversity as possible. So, um, yeah, maybe. And luckily, now, now everyone can technically get a chance to be heard. And now, it's, uh, now we just have to prove ourselves. Yes. Take it seriously. Take the chance and, and do what we can. And I think I think through the through these movements as well. I think um, the cards have been shuffled differently again. And I think through through that that it's been shuffled again. I think there's a lot of potential for people to find a unique voice and actually really make themselves heard because people are listening at the moment. But at the same time, like always, you still have to sell yourself. It's still a competitive market, and I think. Um, you should not only go for diversity, but also use the chance in that moment to actually have a unique voice. I think that with all these unique, with these diverse voices, there, there is, as Michael said right at the beginning, there is such a demand for content. There, there is so much content out there that there is, that the, the streamers and the broadcasters and the content producers, I uh, hate that word, but, but for want of a better word, those content producers are finding it very difficult to stand out with their shows. And one way that they can really stand out is to have diversity in terms of musical voice. And that's an opportunity for them to really help their shows stand out. It's an opportunity for composers to come through from diverse backgrounds um, and so we have to grab that and exploit that um, for our for our benefit you know, at, at the same time and I also think that education is so important that's not something that we've really touched on but creating opening people's opening young people's minds from a very young age you know if you look at the the music syllabuses that the, you know, if you're doing grades, grade one, grade two, grade three, the associated examining boards, you're learning music from a very narrow field of composers. If we get diverse composers and they're studying in, in schools and colleges, they're studying the music of diverse composers, surely that's a great way to, to you know, from a very young age, ingrain in them 
the diversity as opposed to just having diversity as an adult. It's it's there from a very, very young age. And um, that's, you know, to, to inspire children, the, the, their musical instruments and the composers that they're actually studying. So I think, you know, there's an opportunity there for, for diversity to grow from that from that sort of in you know influential um age uh, mm. young kids thank you very much <laughs> for joining this discussion and again very sad that we didn't sit close to each other on a stage in wonderful ghent but hopefully for all of us in the world we will do that next year and stupid COVID is over then or maybe not over but different let's call it like this so thank you very much for joining and um yeah enjoy your day and have lovely work to do um for the next time and yeah let's hope for the best thank you very much thank you milena thank you milena bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.